My name is Writer Histories. Welcome to my channel. The wind blew through the open windows as the forest blinked outside. Meanwhile, on the road, a car advanced. Two brothers dozed off in the back seat while the front passenger gazed indifferently at the passing scenery. Isn't it windy too strong? asked the driver, a man around 40 years old. If needed, I can adjust the windows. How do you prefer? No need, replied the front passenger unenthusiastically. We'll be there soon. I can't drive straight to the cave. There's no way to pull off into the woods to park by the roadside, said the man, keeping his eyes on the road. Yes, we'll walk there ourselves, said the young man, seeming not very keen on conversation. And it will be soon when... Suddenly, a voice came from behind. It's still about 15 minutes away, as someone said. By the way, do you guys know the cave is close to tourists? The driver asked cautiously. We're not tourists. We're spelunkers. Our mission is to explore caves, not wander around, replied the man, scratching his head. Vlad, did you know that? I'm Vlad, and this is my brother Anton, said the young man in the front seat, briefly adding, but why are there so many tourists going there? There are many outsiders here. The place is beautiful, but I'm talking about people wanting to enter the cave. I guide tourists frequently, so I know, but it's closed for visitation. Why, I asked Anton, who had already woken up and was listening to the conversation. Many people have gone missing there, said the man, shivering. They found the remains of a teenager with his feet cut off a few meters from the cave entrance, so they closed it to visitors. Before, the tours didn't go very deep into the cave, of course, just through the main corridor. Then rumors started circulating about hidden gold inside, and people started going there hoping to get rich. But no one found anything. At least, not in the news. I haven't heard of it. But the fact that people are disappearing and some bodies are found there is disturbing, although not many pay attention to it. Anything can happen. We've had missing persons before, some fall into the hands of bears, others fall off mountains. But when they started finding people in the cave. At first, they thought some animal attacked them, ate part of the bodies, and left them there. Experts, veterinarians, and zoologists came, but they couldn't find anything useful. They tried to say it was because of bites, but they couldn't identify what kind of animal it could be. They looked, gave their opinions, and left. Of course, the tours were interrupted after that. People began to avoid the cave, and then what happened next? Roma asked anxiously. Nothing. As I said, they came, saw, scratched their heads, and left. After that, the authorities closed the cave, and nobody volunteered to find out who was doing it, exclaimed Vlad, turning his head slightly towards him. The authorities didn't offer any reward, and nobody else seemed interested. What do you guys think? Vlad asked. What can I say? It's my job. Turning the wheel, feeding the family, not to any house, but beyond my suspicions nothing will change, there are missing, let the people paid for it solve it. In the car, silence reigned. Each was lost in their own thoughts. This whole story started not too long ago. Roma's father was an experienced spelunker. Unlike the boys, he studied caves, plotted routes, collected rock samples. Roma often asked him about his expeditions, it was really interesting to him. Though he didn't plan to follow in his father's footsteps, at least not into science, occasionally he and his friends made similar trips, mostly out of interest and for the adrenaline rush. In one of these conversations, Yuri Semenovic told his son about this cave, about the gold that supposedly lay there, and even showed him a map that their group had made during the cave study. The map was incomplete, showing only the route they followed with the research group. Unfortunately, due to technical reasons, exploration of the cave had to be interrupted at that time, but the map remained. The current events were still unknown to the boys, so unsuspectingly, Roma wanted to go there a little later. Roma relayed this news to his friends Vlad and Anton. The news about the gold was met with enthusiasm by them. It was a real treasure, collectors and black market smugglers would pay a handsome sum for coins, at least that's what the boys thought. Determined not to postpone wealth, they bought what was missing, studied the route, and set off. 
The costs were significant but the boys didn't regret it, hoping that selling the gold would offset everything and still leave them almost on site. The car veered off the road and stopped at the forest's edge. Be careful, boys, we wouldn't like to read about you in our newspaper, Vasily said. Of course, thank you, Anton replied, paying the driver. Goodbye. Great, Vlad said, stretching his back. I was all stiff in that little car. Well, let's go, Roma said, pulling the backpack straps and breathing in the fresh air after the car's smoky atmosphere. Speaking of missing people, what do you guys think? Vlad's hesitant voice came. Oh, that must be the trolls grabbing everyone and then cooking them in a big cauldron in the middle of the cave and eating them, Anton laughed, slapping him. Don't be silly, man. Do you really believe in that nonsense? It could be a wild or deranged animal. Grab it and you won't need more money, he replied, more confident now. And what if it's just a scary story for tourists? Or the driver likes to make up stuff. That's what he tells everyone. Come on, time waits for no one, Roma said, turning around and heading towards the forest. The scent of pine was noticeable, intoxicating their minds with its aroma. On a nearby pine tree, the boys saw a squirrel watching them for a moment before disappearing among the branches. The sun was scorching. It was a good but stifling sensation. Not even the shade in the forest saved them from the heat. The boys, damp with sweat and burdened by heavy backpacks, trudged along in single file up the steep slope. This heat is unbearable. Why couldn't we have come on a cooler day, grumbled Vlad, pulling his shirt up and wiping the sweat from his brow. I'd rather be home right now, murmured Anton. Listen. The three stopped instantly, tuning into the sounds around them. The hillside continued its life, completely oblivious to the three men who, in an instant, had turned into statues. What's that? whispered Roma. After a few moments, came the reply, water. There's a stream nearby. By the sound of it, seems like it's to the right. Don't you hear it? Anton responded, turning his head towards the supposed sound of water. Yeah, sounds like a stream, agreed his brother, heading in that direction. All three followed to the right and after a short distance, they spotted the stream. Fresh water bubbled up from somewhere beneath the earth and flowed briskly in a shallow trench that appeared to have been naturally formed, bringing life to the grass growing along its banks. Their faces instantly lit up with smiles. They dropped their heavy backpacks and began scooping up the cold water with their hands, washing their faces and quenching their thirst. Come on, we need to keep going, Anton reminded, heading back to his backpack. They all geared up. The trio continued towards the goal of their journey. The cave wasn't far, they just needed to ascend the slope and then veer a bit more to the right, where the entrance lay nestled in the mountainside. Finally, sighed Roma, wiping his face with his hands as they walked again, still damp from the heat. The three halted and gazed into the darkness of the cave, which beckoned them with its coolness but also daunted them with the unknown. Near the entrance, the boys dropped their loads, shed their clothes, and stowed them in their backpacks. Instead of shorts and t-shirts, they donned warmer attire, grabbed the necessary equipment, and the darkness of the cave swallowed them as they entered. The corridor was cramped, and the first to speak was Vlad, I agree, he replied. It's tight in here. What does the map say, Roma? We shouldn't turn yet, he said, illuminating the map with his flashlight. We haven't turned yet, confirmed Roma, scrutinizing the map as they walked straight ahead. There'll be a left turn coming up soon. We won't turn there, it's a dead end. So, what do we do when the path ends? We'll figure it out. Plus, we can leave marks to find our way back. Right, said Vlad, adding, and once we find the gold, we'll sell it in Thailand. Come on, let's find it. We haven't even walked a mile yet and you're already talking about selling. Can't you dream a little? Stop it, you guys are messing around with all this chatter, interrupted Roma. And what do you want to hear here? There's no one to hear, Anton said, with a grin, then shouted, Is anyone there? Do you see anyone? No, absolutely no one, he mocked. Why'd you do that, Roma? Why'd you do that? Ah, forget it. Just messing around. You're being too serious, said, reconciling, stretching a smile. 
Anton's shout echoed through the tunnel, carrying the echo into the depths of the cave, seeming like the sounds penetrated the crevices, stuck to the walls, and spread through the corridors. For a while, they walked in silence, sometimes the corridors narrowed, and the brothers had to stoop. The heavy backpacks weighed on their shoulders, and they were longing to rest. The new trekking shoes were starting to hurt their feet. It felt like the stone path would never end, and they would just keep walking forever. Despite the lack of light, the boys didn't feel afraid. Each had their flashlight strapped to their forehead, and it was almost running out of batteries. I'm tired of this path, complained Anton, rubbing his neck. Maybe the gnomes are doing it for themselves, Aroma suggested. Once again, silence reigned, and then the space began to expand. The stone ceiling of the tunnel started to rise, and they breathed more easily. All three looked at each other. They quickened their pace. Watch out here, Aroma warned. A slope, Vlad exclaimed. He was the last to see his brother's back, which wasn't as inclined to descend, but still, they didn't rush. Descending slowly, balancing with their hands, the boys found themselves below. It would be nice to rest, suggested Anton. And he approached Roma. What's beyond on the map? Here we can take a break, he pointed to the drawing. Roma, do you see something like a room here? We'll have to go through this gorge and see what's beyond, he said, thoughtfully. We'll probably have to take off the backpacks," observed Anton. There's no other choice, we don't want to risk getting into these holes, it's a dead end everywhere here, you see? Roma replied, shining the flashlight on the walls, only the passage was to the left. Got it, grumbled Anton. They all turned and headed left. They were greeted by a towering wall that extended upward, with a dark corridor within it, as if it were filled with something sinister. Quiet, said Vlad. It's okay, you're not new to walking in dark corridors, Roma tried to cheer him up. It's not the first time, but this isn't a corridor, it's too narrow, it's too, the older brother suddenly said. It's not the time or place to talk about this, it'll be fine, said Anton, joining his index fingers in a circle. They took off their backpacks and held them in their hands, they began to descend. Anton in the lead, then Roma and Vlad. They moved slowly, carefully, trying not to hurt themselves on the protrusions and not to snag the backpacks. Step by step, meter by meter, they approached the edge of the rift. Contrary to expectations, there were no drafts or at least a breeze. The air felt dense and suffocating. In Vlad's head, treacherous thoughts swirled, that they would be crushed and eventually find three crushed bodies between the walls of this passage, with broken ribs and crushed heads. Anton illuminated ahead, hoping to see an exit, but so far there was none. At some point, the boys decided to take a break and stopped. They had been resting for several minutes when suddenly Anton felt something touch him, he froze, something was touching him, barely touching him. Paralyzed by fear, he was so terrified that he could only whisper softly, hey, someone's touching me. Who's touching you? Vlad asked immediately. I don't know, someone, someone touched my neck, he whispered hoarsely. Roma directed the light to his companion's neck, and his eyes widened in surprise. A spider. What spider? There are no spiders here. Anton whispered. Get it off me, please, please, he pleaded. As you can see, there are spiders here, at least one. How am I going to get it off, I don't know. Somehow, get it off, he trembled. Anton wasn't afraid of spiders, but not in this situation. He was practically trapped in a small space. A spider could be there, and they had no antidote in their backpack, and how would it be if that had never happened? Panic and fear overtook him. He just wanted to run and get rid of the creature. His whole body itched. Meanwhile, the spider, calmly seated on his shoulder, began to move again and touched with its front legs the exposed skin between the neck and the collar of the jacket. Stay still, Aroma said softly. I'll try to get it off now. I'm afraid it might climb up to my face, Anton's voice was clearly full of panic. Roman slowly raised his hand so as not to scare the spider. The whole operation took a few minutes. He grabbed the spider slowly and threw it away as far as possible. Well done, Anton began reproachfully. We have to move on now. Sorry, I should have left it with you. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Anton replied, relieved. They moved on again. 
After a while, Anton saw that the gorge was ending and immediately informed the others about this joyful news. With this good news, they caught their breath and moved as fast as they could. Wow, said Vlad, illuminating the cave they were in. Look here, on the wall they saw some strange marks, as if someone had left parallel stripes in a chaotic manner. Was a bear here? Roma asked. Yes, but before that, it got so skinny that it managed to squeeze through that crevice we have behind us, Anton tried to joke. The lines really looked strange, they were in different places, at different heights, some looked solitary and others looked like they formed groups of five, as if someone had been sharpening claws here. It's strange that there's no mention of this on the map, the Anton remarked. Yes, just like about the slope. Not a word or a drawing, added his younger brother. I don't know, but it wasn't dad who drew this map, it was another member of the group. And by the way, I have bad news. The whole path we've passed so far is poorly marked, Vlad had already examined the place and was waiting for the results from the gas analyzer. Alright, we can rest here. There's a well, Anton's voice came from somewhere in the darkness. What well? Roma and Vlad asked. Well, a tunnel downwards, guys, the boys headed there immediately. Anyone can go through there without a problem. Plus, there's a rope fixed to anchors. But what surprised them was that the descent walls were polished, and here and there they could see the tracks they had encountered a little earlier. I don't like this. The rope is fine, of course, but it's strange. The rock is too smooth. And again, these strange lines. But we don't necessarily have to go that way. We can go through the corridor on the other side, take a break, and stretch our legs finally. Resting on a special mat, the guys enjoyed sandwiches and drank hot tea from the thermos. There was no rush, the gold wasn't going anywhere. But the rest was necessary. They exchanged their boots for comfortable sneakers, took off their helmets leaving only a large flashlight illuminating, and chatted. What if we don't find gold, or if we find it and it's underwater? We don't have diving gear, Vlad said. Enough, it's too much already. How long can we go on like this? We haven't even entered the cave and you're already spreading this pessimism, Anton attacked his brother. Suddenly, not suddenly, your whole mood is ruined, the younger one didn't reply. I continued to dig the can with a spoon, as if someone was walking with wet feet. Listen, Roma pointed out. Yes, it's my little brother here sniffling, Anton joked. I'm serious, listen, everyone stayed silent for two or three minutes. Nothing happened, and nothing was heard until suddenly, it dripped, dripped, very quietly, barely audible. It's a water leak from somewhere, maybe from above, and it's collecting into a puddle, Vlad replied, annoyed. Maybe you're right. What if we stay here today, rest and sleep, and then continue the search tomorrow after breakfast? Each of them was busy with their own things, their own tasks. Vlad took off his socks and grabbed the first aid kit to tend to his feet, while Roma and Anton grabbed sleeping bags and thermal clothing. They placed a large flashlight in the center and laid out the sleeping mats around it, forming a triangle. After arranging the sleeping bags, Roma asked, shall we take turns keeping watch, already deciding that if there was a watch, he would be the last. I don't think it makes sense, Vlad replied, already inside his sleeping bag. Then it settled, Roma reached out to the flashlight and pressed the off button. It wasn't a very good sleep, it was cold, and somewhere in the crevices, the wind howled, but Roma was quickly lulled back to sleep by the gusts of wind. Waking up the group was complicated, they were all very cold, and Anton's lower back hurt, he complained all the time about how useless it was to have come, and how he could continue like this if he couldn't even bend properly. On the other hand, Vlad was fine, his leg wasn't bothering him much, he just wanted to eat and warm up. The boys quickly coordinated the supplies, water, coffee, utensils, and began preparing breakfast. The aromatic coffee, rice porridge with canned beans, and chocolate were an amazing meal. Let's eat everything, said Roma, chewing the last bite. They heard sounds as if someone was walking with wet feet. Don't start, it's just water, Anton interrupted. After the meal, they washed the dishes, gathered the garbage in a separate bag, changed clothes, and, making sure there were no traces of the camp, set off. They didn't descend but followed another path. At first, the corridor was narrow, but then it widened, they no longer needed to bend their heads. 
Since it was a new path, they decided to leave marks so they could find their way back without problems. The darkness was very unpleasant. Someone is following behind me, Vlad whispered. Here we go again, Anton rolled his eyes. No, I'm serious. I vividly feel that someone is behind me and watching me. He's tapping his fingers toward me. He turned abruptly but saw no one. We need to find a place to camp, Roma broke the silence. A pause or an overnight stop? Vlad specified. The second one, we've walked enough today, and besides, we're going farther and farther away. There's nothing resembling a hidden treasure. We have few supplies with us. Let's rest and sleep tonight and tomorrow we'll decide whether to continue or turn back. A sensible decision, Vlad replied. We can go to the end of the corridor. Maybe there's an exit. It was a general joy when they quickly found another chamber. Look, there's another well here. Vlad exclaimed in surprise. The hole was practically at the entrance. But unlike the previous one, it didn't have a cylindrical shape. The walls seemed polished and lines could be seen on them and the flashlight's light illuminated the bottom. The depth was about three to four meters. I think, said Anton, adjusting his helmet, it's a tunnel or even a network of tunnels. Well, let's set up camp. I'm hungry. It's been a while since the last meal, said Roma, and the usual script continued. They changed clothes, replaced the batteries in their headlamps, and, leaving the large light source in the center, positioned themselves around it, took out the dishes, placed the pot on the fire, and began to prepare. Water for tea, dinner was also great, with canned goods, porridge, tea, and energy bars, satisfying them. After warming up, the boys settled into their sleeping bags and almost instantly fell asleep. Roma slept poorly, hearing some kind of commotion and rustling through the sleep. At one point, he woke up, his eyes widening widely around, a dense and endless darkness. But in this darkness, he heard strange and unexplained sounds. As if someone was moving about, not turning on the light so as not to wake the others, and suddenly he heard it. The rustling of the sleeping bag being dragged, the snap on the floor, and then something being dragged. He quickly got up, grabbed the flashlight with trembling hands, pressed the power button, dispersing the darkness. His friends were not by his side, they had disappeared. Roma shone the light toward the sound and saw the scene of Anton being dragged. Long hands and claws were pulling him toward the vertical tunnel. Anton's body disappeared, and he heard the thud when he hit the floor of the lower corridor. Surprised, he screamed, forgetting that he shouldn't do that in the cave. For a moment, someone's vaguely human head appeared in the opening, emitting a horrible scream, then plunged back. All he could see and understand was that someone with big eyes had killed them and taken them away. He shuddered with the light and his body trembled. The beam of the flashlight swung across the walls, illuminating the empty campsite, no friends, no belongings. Not even his backpack. All that was left for Roma were the sleeping bags and a flashlight. No, no, no. The confused thought spun in his mind. What was that? What the hell was that? Roma couldn't calm down, the shock didn't wear off, heightened by fear, his heart beating hard, he pinched himself to calm down. He finally began to realize that it wasn't a dream, that his brothers were no longer there, and all the while, they weren't alone. She followed us. What to do? I need to get out of here, he said to himself in a trembling voice. The sound of his own voice calmed him down a little and directed his thoughts. It's good they left marks on the walls, as long as the flashlight doesn't go out. He shook himself, put on gloves, grabbed the flashlight and headed for the exit, resisting the urge to look down the tunnel. What if the creature is waiting there for him? This is madness, no, no, no. Roma could never calm down, his mind refused to believe what he saw. The shock, fueled by fear, made his heart beat hard, he pinched himself to calm down. Focus, don't panic. As long as there's light, I'm safe. The way back to the grotto must be close, he whispered to himself, moving forward. Saying it was easy, doing it was hard. How would he get home? How would he explain to relatives what happened to his brothers? How would he continue living knowing what happened? But that was for later. For now run run. Roma's eyes bounced off the corridor walls, hoping to see marks or an exit. 
He began to calm down, he heard no footsteps, no growls, no one was chasing him. Busy eating my friends, he thought, and immediately scolded himself for thinking that way. Finally, with a whisper of joy, he said to himself, I found the exit to the grotto. Now, the hardest part is getting through. As he approached the crevice, he heard a creak, and a creature appeared on the surface. Get away from me, he shouted in horror, pointing the light. But before he could do anything, the creature leaped forward in two bounds and was beside him. For a moment, the creature shoved him, and Roma dropped the flashlight and stepped back on impulse. But the cavernous monster was quick enough to reach the flashlight with its long hands, throwing it away. No! Roma screamed, unable to hold back anymore. And without restraint, get away, get away! He stood in darkness, adrenaline and terror overpowering him. He lunged for the flashlight, but it intercepted it. Quick, agile, strong. A strong push in the chest and Roma coughed, hitting his head on the stone floor of the cave. The pain pierced his head and spread through his eyes. Unable to see anything, he couldn't get up immediately. Sounds of guttural grunts echoed, and then long fingers closed around his ankle. He tried to fight, kicking with his feet, trying to hit the monster's hand with his left foot, but he couldn't. The grip was strong, the creature shook him intentionally. He hit his head again and saw nothing but darkness. The last thing Roma felt was his body sliding down the wall of the vertical tunnel, following the creature dragging him and hitting the rocks as he fell from a height. If you liked it, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel, thank you and see you next time. My name is Ricardo Lopez, I'm 40 years old and I live in Rio de Janeiro. I work as a maintenance technician and spent over a decade traversing the long corridors of the Hospital de Santa Casa de Misericordia. However, the night of that cursed Monday, May 18, 2009, is the one that still haunts me immeasurably. This story is entirely true, although I try to make my life easier by believing it was just a terrifying illusion. It was the last shift of the day, and my co-worker Carlos, a brave 45-year-old man, and I always stayed late to finish our tasks. We were casually discussing Sunday's soccer game when suddenly, a flickering light at the end of the corridor caught our attention. It was a sign that something was wrong. We walked to the location, to a room at the end of the corridor. But before we could reach the door, something strange happened, the corridor lights went out completely. We were only lit by the moonlight streaming through the windows. I remember distinctly feeling a shiver run through my entire body, in a silence so thick we could hear our own hearts beating. We continued walking until we finally reached the door of the room in question, room 412. It was one of those rooms we called the E-Cold Room, as strangely the temperature there was always lower. That night, however, the cold was so piercing that we could see our own breath vaporizing. We entered the room and darkness enveloped us like a somber veil. I tried to turn on the flashlight on my phone, but strangely the device had shut off. As I made a futile attempt to turn it back on, we heard a sharp scream echoing through the corridors. We looked at each other in terror, our blood ran cold, but we knew we had to get out of there. We ran out of the room in search of light and help, but the hospital seemed entirely different, as if we were trapped in a twisted nightmare. It was as if the souls of those who had passed there were somewhere nearby. Finally, we managed to return to the reception area, where we found Maria, the only night nurse on duty. A woman around 70 years old, she was shaken, her white hair disheveled, and her eyes filled with fear. We told her what had happened, and she, in shock, just handed us a crucifix, saying that there was something terrible in the hospital that night. At that moment, reality snapped back for me. Fear had overtaken me, but seeing Maria in that state made me realize that we needed to gather all our courage to do what was necessary. We returned to room 412 after ensuring that all the hospital lights were on. Fear still lingered over us, but we needed to do our job. As we entered the room, we saw that somehow the room lights were on and everything seemed normal. We fixed the burnt-out bulbs and everything returned to normal. However, Carlos and I were no longer the same. That night was etched in my mind, the shadows of the corridor, the noises, and the intense cold of that room, and especially that scream. I know that something beyond our understanding happened there. Despite everything, I keep telling myself that it was just a misunderstanding, a terrifying illusion we called supernatural. 
But on dark and silent nights, when everything is calm, the memories of that night come back vividly like never before and question me, was it really just an illusion? I grew up in a small town nestled in the heart of the Brazilian countryside. Our setting was marked by tranquility, only interrupted by the whisper of trees and the murmur of streams. But there was a shadow that loomed over us, the abandoned hospital. In 1993, it was abruptly vacated, leaving behind a dark enigma that intrigued everyone. At that time, I was 16 years old, accompanied by my friend Pedro. Our group was completed by the lively presence of Camila, a 15-year-old girl, and her older sister, Janena, who was 17. Boredom was our constant companion on those monotonous afternoons, fueling our youthful curiosity. That's how we decided to explore the dark corners of the town, immersing ourselves in the mysterious aura of the old hospital. Its peeling gray walls and broken windows stood like silent witnesses to a forgotten past, while dense vegetation enveloped it in a somber embrace. On a hot summer night in 1999, around 10 o'clock, youthful boredom led us once again to the abandoned hospital. We split up to increase the thrill of ghost hunting. For some reason, I found myself alone, exploring the west side, while Pedro, Rebecca, and Camila ventured into the east side. My steps led me to the old surgical block. The air there was chilly, permeated with the odor of mold that had taken hold in the bowels of the desolate building. I turned on my flashlight, illuminating a scene worthy of nightmares, rusty surgical equipment and old beds lined up along the walls, silent witnesses to a once glorious past now faded away. That's when I heard the whisper, a soft and sinister murmur echoing down the corridor to my left. My heart raced, but curiosity overcame fear. I advanced down the narrow, dark corridor until I came upon a small room. And there, hanging from the ceiling, was it, a hospital mannequin draped in a white dress, spinning slowly like a macabre dance of death. It looked so real, so vivid, that sweat broke out on my forehead and I fled, overwhelmed by terror. When I shared my experience with my friends, I was met with skeptical laughter. But as the days passed, we found out that we were not the only ones haunted by that sight. Locals shared similar stories, fueling rumors of strange activities and missing patients. Terrified by what we discovered, we decided to put an end to our adventures in the abandoned hospital. The town, once a haven of tranquility, now seemed shrouded in an aura of mystery and fear, its ruins guarding dark secrets that should never be disturbed. That experience left a profound mark on us, leaving invisible scars that we only understood years later. We learned that some stories, no matter how incredible they may seem, have deep roots in reality, and that true terror often resides where we least expect it. My name is Clara, and what I'm about to recount is an episode that marked my life three years ago when I was rushed to a hospital in downtown Sao Paulo. The intense headaches and persistent vomiting were the harbinger of a terrifying journey. On that gloomy dawn, I was hastily taken to an old hospital, immersed in dimness and the suffocating smell of ether and disinfectant. The corridors, dark and cold, seemed to pulsate with a sinister energy that sent shivers down my spine. I was greeted by Nurse Rebecca, a robust, dark-skinned figure whose kindness contrasted with the hospital's gloomy environment. She led me to the emergency room, where I encountered Dr. Enrique, an elderly doctor with a morbid expression but eyes that seemed to hold deep secrets. Despite his advanced age, Dr. Enrique exhibited a disturbing liveliness that made me uncomfortable. Shortly after my arrival, I plunged into a deep sleep, only to awaken in an even more frightening scenario. The emergency room was plunged into darkness, illuminated only by the flickering light of a distant lamp at the end of the hallway. I realized I was alone, surrounded by deafening silence, where only whispers seemed to echo. A chill ran down my spine as my senses went into high alert. What was once a hospital had now turned into a maze of fear and uncertainty, where every hidden shadow seemed to harbor a dark secret. Then, as if awakened by a sinister omen, the whispering intensified, turning into menacing murmurs echoing through the empty corridors. And I, trapped in this waking nightmare, knew that something terrible was about to happen. From the curtain swaying in the chilly wind that entered through the window, a shiver ran down my spine as I felt the urge to use the bathroom. It was then that I spotted a figure traversing the hallway. I thought about calling out to them, but something made me hesitate. 
A dark premonition seized me, and I decided to follow that figure resembling Nurse Rebecca. The only sound besides the footsteps echoing through the corridors was a faint, distant lament, like a sigh of anguish coming from one of the examination rooms. Upon entering that room, I was met with a scene that made my heart freeze with terror. A woman lying on the examination table, her skin pale and cadaverous, sobbing, and her tears were blood. In a panic, I ran back to the safety of my room, stumbling along the way. However, before reaching my refuge, I encountered Dr. Enrique, motionless like a somber statue in a dark corner. His vacant eyes seemed to stare into nothingness as his words echoed in my mind, sending chills down every fiber of my being, you always come back because you don't rest. Scared and confused, I returned to my bed, spending the rest of the night in a disturbing state of wakefulness, listening to the muffled lamentations from the adjacent room intensifying with each passing moment. At dawn, Dr. Enrique had disappeared, and Rebecca vehemently denied any knowledge of patients in that examination room. I later found out that the hospital had been closed for decades due to allegations of inhumane medical practices. As for Dr. Enrique, well, his death 30 years ago was surrounded by controversies related to his professional conduct. As for the woman in the examination room, I believe she is just one of the many tormented souls that roam that abandoned hospital. I never returned to that place again, but even now, sometimes at night, I can still hear her painful lamentations echoing in my thoughts, like an ethereal echo of a dark past that refuses to be forgotten. My name is Paolo, and I'm 34 years old. What I'm about to recount here happened in 2016, when there was an incident at the hospital in Minas. Up until now, I still haven't fully comprehended what I experienced back then and I try to keep it at bay as much as possible. It's believed to have been a byproduct of my own state of distress and extreme exhaustion. Due to the nature of the work, the images aren't displayed, and the experiences I had were so intense that the lingering remnants still haunt me. No matter how much I try to rationalize them, it's just not possible. I acted as the sole surgeon on that endless Saturday night into Sunday morning, in a healthcare unit in a small town in the interior of the state, with minimal resources. Things started to get strained due to underfunding and strange cases emerged around 1 am. A man around 50 years old and another about 60 years old arrived at the emergency room with severe respiratory problems. Osvaldo's eyes expressed the terror his mind was feeling as I fought tirelessly for each single breath. Nurse Luisa, age 28, rushed to provide the necessary support. As I was filling out paperwork, tension induced an unexpected tremor. It felt like the ground around me had been replaced, taken over by an electric current and the sensation of weight became almost palpable. A sudden cold ran through my skin, sending shivers down my spine. The disturbance didn't take long to manifest. Osvaldo's condition worsened to the point where I was forced to pronounce his death. Although it was a frequent occurrence in the region, my profession never becomes simpler and the atmosphere grew even heavier. It was a tension that compelled me to avoid Osvaldo's death. The hospital emptied out and silence descended, with the dim light of the early morning more unsettling than expected. I was so exhausted that I had to return home and try to rest a bit in the waiting room before dawn. As I arrived at the hospital, my breath caught in my throat as the corridor began flickering and dancing synchronously between light and darkness, in a strange ballet. At the end of the corridor, a figure of a man dressed in white stood exactly where Osvaldo had been before. He was looking at me, but his face was shrouded in shadows. For some reason, my instinct screamed to run, but my feet wouldn't obey. I was completely frozen as the man walked toward me, each step echoing through the silent corridor. I recognized that figure as Osvaldo, although he appeared younger, his eyes still filled with terror. Before I could do anything, the flickering light stopped and Osvaldo vanished, leaving only darker shadows and a deafening silence. My legs gave way, and I collapsed on the corridor floor, gasping, my heart pounding erratically in my chest. I woke up to Luisa shaking me worriedly, asking if I was okay. I felt confused, after all, I was lying in the corridor. I've never shared this experience with anyone before simply because I didn't believe it myself. I tried to convince myself that it was a manifestation of my fatigue, a hallucination resulting from many sleepless nights and the sudden grief of losing a patient. 
However, whenever my work keeps me up at night, I see familiar faces in the corner of my eye, the air grows heavy, and a sense of terror runs through my body. I try to ignore the fear I feel and the cold that kisses my skin, still trying to believe that it was just a product of my exhaustion. But the memory of that night, Osvaldo's face, and the gloomy corridors of the hospital refuse to fade from my memory. The souls, if I can call them that, of the many people I've lost, still linger within those walls in the darkness of the night. And I, despite being frightened, continue my journey trying to do what I know best, saving lives. My name is Alexander, I'm 48 years old, and I'm a specialist in internal medicine, dedicating a significant part of my career to the oldest and most mysterious hospital in Porto Alegre. In these 23 years of experience, I've encountered a wide range of medical cases, from stories of resilience to deep traumas that have left indelible emotional marks. However, nothing could prepare me for the strange series of events that would unfold in the intensive care unit. The first indication arose on a hectic day, typical of hospital routine. An elderly patient, aged 65, began murmuring in a notably agitated state, referring to an elderly lady who, according to him, remained by his bedside, observing him with penetrating eyes. Although I tried to calm his agitation, that incident left a lingering unease in my mind. And it wasn't an isolated case. In the following months, a series of similar reports flooded the medical team, challenging our rational understanding and leaving us perplexed. We decided to investigate discreetly, fearing to cause unnecessary panic among the patients. As we analyzed the records of the patients who described these visions, a chilling discovery came to light, they all passed away within a few weeks after encounters with these inexplicable presences. A dark theory began to form in our troubled minds, could these souls be the former inhabitants of the ICU, reluctant to leave behind the place where they found their ultimate peace? As a man of science, I found myself facing a dilemma between reason and the supernatural, between the tangible and the inexplicable. I sought the testimony of Valeria, a veteran nurse, whose memories proved even more disturbing. Her childhood story, lived in the corridors of the same hospital, revealed a dark connection between past and present. Valeria recalled a fateful night, at the age of 13, when she witnessed the presence of an elderly figure by her dying father's bedside. The old woman's wrinkled face expressed a macabre serenity as she held the hand of the agonizing man. The outcome of that night was tragic, with Valeria's father passing away and the inexplicable disappearance of the enigmatic figure. From this frightening account, it became clear that the roots of the mystery stretched back decades, intertwining with the hospital's history and its sinister depths. We faced the fear of the unknown with counseling sessions for patients, offering emotional and mental support in the face of the inexplicable. However, even with our tireless efforts, the apparitions persisted, echoing like echoes of the past in a tormented present. Uncertainty hung over us, doctors, nurses, and patients, like a dense fog that refuses to dissipate. Today, as I continue my rounds in the ICU, the specter of an invisible presence seems to dance in the corners of my vision, whispering dark secrets to the ears of the most vulnerable patients. I face this journey with a mixture of fear and fascination, aware that in the hospital, life and death are not the only threads in the tapestry of existence. There is something more, something that transcends human understanding and challenges the limits of science, a mystery that continues to haunt us, even beyond the hospital walls, in an eternal dance between the beyond and the here. The cool night breeze danced among the trees as I nestled close to the crackling fire. The flames cast shifting shadows against the darkness of the Piranha countryside, where I had decided to start anew. My name is Leonardo, and this is the account of my journey in the small town of Pinho, where I was embraced by the simplicity and beauty of rural life. Born and raised amidst the urban chaos of Sao Paulo, I found myself lost in the frenetic routine and everyday stress. The deafening traffic, imposing buildings, and constant hustle had slowly eroded my sanity. Despite appreciating the luxuries and comforts that the big city offered, I knew something essential was missing, peace of mind. So, when the opportunity to move to the countryside arose, I seized it with both hands. I was willing to trade the rush and the fatter paycheck for a more serene and fulfilling way of life. I arrived at my uncle's farm in Pinho with a mix of nervousness and hope pulsating in my chest. After all, this would be my chance to rediscover the true meaning of tranquility. 
As I crossed the farm gate, I was greeted by the fresh scent of damp earth and the birdsong echoing across the green expanse before me. It was as if a weight had been lifted off my shoulders, and I breathed more freely than I had in years. However, the adaptation was not easy. The dark and silent nights, which had once seemed like a promise of peace, now haunted me with an unfamiliar loneliness. But over time, I learned to appreciate the simple beauty of life in the countryside. Each dawn was a masterpiece painted by the rising sun, and each sunset was a symphony of colors that soothed my restless soul. Here, far from the distractions of the city, I found the peace I had longed for. And although my journey is only just beginning, I know that every step taken towards this new life is a step in the right direction. For in the serenity of rural life, I discovered the true meaning of happiness, being in harmony with myself and the world around me. So, as the embers of the fire glow under the starry sky, I feel grateful to have found my refuge in this corner of tranquility in the heart of Piranha. And may this story serve as a reminder that sometimes, it takes leaving the familiar behind to find the true essence of life. While the fluorescent lights of the office dazzled my tired eyes, my cell phone began to vibrate frantically. Amidst documents and emails, my father's name flashed on the screen. Surprised, I answered the call, feeling a mix of nostalgia and curiosity. Hey, Dad, I greeted, feeling a lump of emotion in my throat. Leo, my son, how's life in the big city? My father's familiar voice echoed from the other end of the line, filled with longing and concern. As we exchanged news and updates about our lives, my father mentioned an unexpected situation. My cousin Marcio needed to sort out some matters in the big city and was lost in the concrete and asphalt maze. My father's suggestion was clear, offer hospitality and assistance to him during his stay in the city. Sure thing dad, don't worry. It'll be a pleasure to help out Marcio, I reassured, knowing that my cousin's presence would bring some life into my solitary routine in the metropolis. Marcio arrived shortly after, with his typical energy and a wide smile. As he sorted out his pending matters in the city, our conversations revealed a mutual desire to escape the urban hustle in search of a simpler and more authentic life. You have no idea what you're missing, Leo. Life here is so different, so much more real, he remarked, his voice full of admiration and nostalgia. His words resonated with me, awakening a dormant seed of desire for change that had been inside me for a long time. I'm glad you liked it, Marcio. I think I'm ready for a change too, I confessed, feeling a knot in my stomach at the prospect of leaving my urban life behind. That's when Marcio mentioned an opportunity at the family farm in Piranha. An invitation to trade the concrete and traffic for the greenery and tranquility of the countryside. You'll be trading your car for a horse, he joked, but there was sincerity in his gaze. With a racing heart and a mix of emotions, I accepted the challenge. Selling my belongings and embracing uncertainty, I moved to the small town of Pinho, where my uncle and his family welcomed me with open arms. The reality shock was immense, but the hospitality and warmth compensated for any initial discomfort. Soon, I found myself immersed in rural life, helping out on the farm and discovering a sense of belonging that I had never experienced in the big city. And so, amidst the verdant fields and starry nights of rural Piranha, I began to write a new chapter in my story. A chapter marked by simplicity, by connection with nature, and above all, by the courage to follow my heart in pursuit of a more authentic and meaningful life. In the first few days on the farm, I fully embraced rural life. The fresh air invigorated my lungs, and homemade food made me forget about the fast food and fancy restaurants of the big city. On one of those sunny mornings, my uncle invited me to accompany him to the town to buy groceries. I was excited about the prospect of exploring more of the region and readily accepted. On the way, we chatted animatedly, sharing stories and laughter. But the mood shifted when my uncle mentioned a strange condition, not to go out alone after 10 p.m., especially unarmed. His serious expression and enigmatic words piqued my curiosity, and a slight shiver ran down my spine. Without beating around the bush, my uncle shared a story that seemed straight out of a horror tale. He spoke of werewolves haunting the forests of the region, appearing on full moon days to terrorize the unwary. Although I tried to disguise my disbelief, his words echoed in my mind, casting a shadow of doubt on the safety of those lands. Despite my skepticism, I agreed to respect the local tradition and beliefs, however strange they might seem. 
After all, who was I to doubt the wisdom of the local inhabitants? However, an event would change my perspective forever. A party in town was scheduled, an event eagerly awaited by everyone in the region. The excitement was palpable as we joined other residents to make our way there, sharing jokes and anticipating the fun that awaited us. As we arrived at the square, flooded with colorful lights and upbeat music, the celebratory atmosphere was contagious. My cousin, always sociable, dove headfirst into the crowd while I observed the excitement around me. However, as the night progressed and the shadows lengthened, a chill of unease settled in my chest. My uncle's ominous words echoed in my mind, fueling a growing fear that I struggled to ignore. And it was then, in the tense silence of the night, that something happened, something that would challenge my convictions and forever change my view of that ancient and mysterious land. The festive atmosphere of the night quickly gave way to a persistent discomfort in my stomach. The combination of drinks began to weigh me down, and the discomfort became unbearable. Although not completely drunk, I knew it was time to leave to avoid ruining my cousin's night. Reluctantly, I announced my departure, but my cousin vehemently opposed. Leo, are you crazy? He argued, with a mix of concern and disbelief. Look at the time. It's too dangerous to walk around here alone at this hour. Let's stay until dawn, when it'll be safe to go back together. Although I tried to downplay my cousin's warnings about the dangers of the region, he persisted in his silent concern. In a gesture of caution, he handed me a small flashlight and a pocket knife, insisting that I take them for protection. Reluctantly, I accepted the items and said goodbye, determined to face the nighttime road alone. The night was clear, the full moon lit the way, and the silence of the early morning was broken only by the gentle chirping of crickets. However, as I progressed along the lonely road, a sense of unease began to creep into my mind. Waves of paranoia plagued me as I passed through dark and dense stretches of vegetation, and a chill ran down my spine when I heard suspicious noises around me. At a certain point along the way, about halfway, the feeling of being watched intensified, increasing my anxiety. Every step seemed to echo too loudly in the darkness, and the rustle of dry leaves under my feet was deafening. It was then that I spotted a shadowy figure on the side of the road, about 50 meters from where I was. At first, I thought it was a large animal, perhaps a wild boar, which occasionally roamed the area. But as I approached, terror froze my blood. The light from the flashlight revealed a grotesque figure, crouched on all fours, breathing heavily. My heart hammered in my chest as I tried to rationalize the scene before me. But then, in a shiver of horror, that creature rose to its hind legs, emitting a guttural growl that pierced the stillness of the night. Fear paralyzed my limbs, but the instinct for survival screamed within me. With trembling hands, I brandished the pocket knife, prepared to confront the unknown looming before me on that dark road. The flickering light of the flashlight revealed a sight that defied all logic and understanding. A creature half-man, half-beast, with pointed ears and a twisted face, emerged from the shadows, its eyes reflecting the flashlight with furious intensity. A wave of terror washed over me, and my survival instinct screamed louder than anything else. Without a second thought, I began to run as fast as my legs would allow, adrenaline pumping through my veins as I distanced myself from that monstrous aberration. The creature seemed ready to hunt me down at any moment, its heavy footsteps echoing behind me as I dashed along the dark road. For a moment, the world around me seemed distorted, as if I were trapped in a surreal nightmare. But the fear was real, and my only concern was to escape from that terrible beast that was rapidly approaching. Then, I spotted a small light on the horizon, a brightly lit house on the side of the road. It was a small farmhouse, an unlikely refuge amidst the darkness of the night. Without hesitation, I jumped the fence and ran towards the house, shouting for help with all my might. The creature was almost catching up to me when I felt a strong blow to my head, and everything went dark. When I woke up, I was in the safety of the farmhouse, surrounded by the concern of a man who had rescued me from the sharp teeth of that demonic creature. I am grateful to have escaped death on that fateful night. The next morning, my uncle greeted me at home with a mix of relief and reprimand. The gentleman who saved me explained that I was lucky to have escaped with my life and that many aren't so fortunate. Looking at my uncle, I realized the weight of his previous warning and the gravity of my own reckless actions. The creature on the road wasn't just a scary story to scare children, but a dark reality I was destined to face. 
From that day on, I learned to respect the beliefs and warnings of those who know the secrets of the wilderness. I never walked alone at night in those dark woods again, and I carry the physical and emotional scars of that experience as a constant reminder of life's fragility and the need to respect the unknown. If you've made it this far, thank you very much and until next time. Alex Lawrence watches as the last yellow leaves are torn from the trees by Babushka Ludmilla in the village cemetery of Kobovea, amidst the biting wind and persistent rain. People quickly bid farewell without ceremony under the harsh weather conditions, alongside the graves of their loved ones. In the rural area around Orsk, each village has its own cemetery, with some having two or three. And in all these places, the cats remain as silent witnesses. Kobovea was completely abandoned about a decade ago, after the death of Ludmilla's husband, Babushka, from a third heart attack, followed by the suicide of their outcast son, who poisoned himself with vodka just nine days after his father's passing. Over time, the octogenarian could no longer maintain the farmstead, and the situation rapidly deteriorated. Only some plots of land were seasonally cultivated. Consequently, distant relatives had to take the elderly woman to the city, leaving the house empty alongside the family that had long since emigrated to Spain with no intention of returning. The walls of the house were faded, and recently the grandmother she had cared for had passed away. Soon after the funeral, the great-grandmother decided to organize the belongings in her old residence in Cobovea. Her parents agreed and called a friend, Kirill, to help. He readily accepted the opportunity to spend the weekend in the isolation of the countryside. A bus departed from the Bryansk bus station to these areas three times a day, taking about half an hour to reach the next regional center. After that, a dirt road wound through the fields before reaching the first houses, two abandoned, two vacation homes, some burnt down and overgrown with vegetation. Vidyak and Kiryuka boarded the first morning bus at 5.50 a.m. Although it wasn't raining when they left, the weather was unpredictable. They disembarked with two concrete slabs and a blue sign with a bus icon on a pole. The dirt road initially meandered through the fields, and as they proceeded, the first houses began to appear, silent witnesses to abandonment and the passage of time. One abandoned house, the last on the edge of the village, belonged to Babushka Ludmilla. The porch had collapsed, the bench was rotten, the garden had been left to nature, and the inside of the house was enveloped in dust and infested with rats. Luckily, Vidyak managed to turn on the lights, there was still electricity, and the kitchen had an electric stove, ensuring they could have hot food and tea without dealing with the cold. A heater was present, though visibly neglected. Kirill assessed the situation and scratched his beard, noting there were few branches to feed the heater. In any case, they began rummaging through Babushka Ludmilla's belongings but found little to go through. The house was practically empty, some furniture, dishes, a chipped jug on the table, sewing accessories on the bedside, and a pile of black and white photographs from different eras, all tied with an elastic band, most depicting funerals. My great-grandfather and great-grandmother had a suitcase full of these photos, Kirill commented. Now it seems kind of outdated. I've never seen anyone take pictures at a funeral, Vidyak agreed. He retied the photographs with the elastic and put them in his backpack to give to his mother later, leaving the decision about their fate to her. It was her business. At 10 a.m., Kirill asked, what are we going to do all day? He had expected to find old treasures to explore in Babushka Ludmilla's house, but the reality was different. They only found empty thread spools and a set of gloomy, melancholic photographs. However, they didn't want to leave too early, as they had made plans and wanted to enjoy the change of scenery and natural beauty of autumn. I don't know, maybe we'll eat something, drink, Vidyak suggested. Kirill then proposed an idea. Oh, I thought of something not too far from here, about six kilometers. Well, not too far, let's say. But what's there? The old village of Alexandrovsky, which was abandoned in 2006. Everyone died or moved away. The village was isolated and it takes a long time to get there, especially in spring with the mud. But the cemetery is probably still there. Let's go, let's take a look. Who knows, we might recognize someone, maybe it'll even make someone cry, Vidyak suggested. Did you ever go there in your childhood, in the early 2000s? Kirill asked, pulling back the curtain to look out the window and seeing that rain was not forecasted for the moment. 
I checked the weather forecast today and they're not promising rain. Let's go, we're not going to spend all day indoors. Plus, no internet. The mobile connection is pretty much non-existent out here, I commented. Oh the internet, there's hardly anywhere ever you go, Vidyak agreed. But at least the online browser is working. But the cemetery is marked, so it exists. That means someone takes care of it, I added. As we walked towards the cemetery, I felt like there was no more village beyond. The road wound around the cemetery, and in the distance, we caught sight of the hunched woods, the tops of the trees covered in grass. The crushed stalks whipped at our shoes as we looked down at the woods below, seeming to hide its secrets among the trees. As we approached the damp, brown graves, Kiryuka began wandering among them as if in a trance, murmuring aloud uncommon surnames that echoed strangely in our ears. Vidyak recounted what he knew about the occupants of the graves, an old woman considered a witch, a man cut up in a fight, another who lived peacefully until his heart suddenly stopped. The years of life were etched on the tombs, but what intrigued us most was the blue monument with an oval portrait, whose name had been erased, but the years of life indicated a distant time. Baba in a headscarf, Kiryuka muttered, as we observed the bronzed face in the photo, with a disproportionately large, almost caricatured chin. And who is this Kiryuka, he asked, but no one seemed to remember. And my mom was also afraid of this old woman as a child, even though we lived together for years, I commented, reflecting on the stories I had heard. But who was she really? A contemporary of ours, just 31 years old, I added. We recalled an old story about a boy who went missing during a storm and was found dead days later. Probably a big cornfield where he got lost, Vidyak suggested. And maybe his grandmother had something to do with it, I murmured, recalling the tales that circulated through the village. But the causes of the boy's death remained obscure, and the medicine of that time offered no conclusive answers. And in the village, what can we expect? Kiryuka commented. Yes, in the village everything is a mystery, I agreed, thinking of the stories that still echoed across the fields and the legends that persisted among the locals. Then he fell into her clutches, and somehow everyone agreed that the boy's face was associated with that squinty old woman. The chimney factory, is that what it is? Kiryuka asked. I have no idea, it doesn't look like a rail line, Vidyak replied. The track wound through the wild meadow, circling an old lakeside pier and entering a small forest. The surrounding landscapes were gloomy and monotonous, the road turning to a working mud track from the traffic of heavy farm equipment. Cars turned onto the paved Karpov Road, signaling the end of the woods and the start of disturbed fields after the harvest. As they continued along the dirt road, Kiryuka questioned where it would take them. It'll probably become more passable by summer, but we'll drown in this mud if we keep going, Vidyak commented. They then opted to skirt the field after the swath of tilled land and proceeded through another unharvested cornfield, with huge dry stalks rustling in the wind like giant praying mantises. Kiryuka found a spot amidst the cornfield to settle down and relax. Bah, Vidyak responded, warning about the risks of the poisonous toxins sprayed by planes during the summer. I agree, but they could plow this field at any moment, he added. They continued their journey, eventually finding a steep trail that was not on the map. Vitka took some photos as they walked and talked. As they approached a small hill at the cemetery, Kiryuka spotted something disturbing. A layer of earth had slid away, revealing a hole where piles of grey bones were exposed in a pool of dirty mud, the eye sockets clearly visible. Let's go home, Kiryuka said, with a tone of discomfort. The path back through familiar places seemed shorter than expected. As they passed a clearing with a rusted sign, Vitka suddenly stopped. Kiryuka also caught sight of something in the clearing and Vitka pointed in the same direction. Kirill approached and peeked from behind the mound of trees. Something was moving there, almost camouflaged by the gloomy autumn forest. People dressed in tall boots, dirty red protective suits, and gas masks stood motionless. Kirill whispered, let's get out of here. Before they could take a step, two round bottles emerged from amidst the trees. The sound of leaves increased, branches creaked under the weight of heavy boot soles. Five people in chemical protective gear and gas masks crossed the tree trunks toward them. The boys ran, crossing the field between the woods and the Kubovsky Cemetery. Only afterward did they look back, no one was in sight. The uncomfortable gear had been left behind. 
Vitka sat down on a bench near the grave, sighing deeply. Kiryuka leaned over, panting, resting his elbows on his knees. They kept their eyes fixed on the forest, waiting for the people in chemical suits to appear, but they did not emerge. Kirill took a deep breath and said, Why didn't you tell us they were patrolling around here? Patrolling what? Vitka protested indignantly. We're a hundred kilometers from the border. Kiryuka spat, his mouth full of saliva after the run. Okay, let's head to the village for now. Arriving in Kubovea, Kirill stopped, looking ahead down the street. What's that? Vitka asked, approaching with concern. Where the wind has blown our worries. Is someone sitting there, or am I imagining things? Kiryuka asked quietly. Vitka took a look and replied, Oh wait, why didn't you tell me there were people around here? Just a few kilometers away. Kiryuka spat the sticky saliva again after the run. Okay, let's head to the village for now. To the hospital or just get rid of Yuva once and for all, Vitka said firmly in his decision. I need to run away and never look back, he thought to himself as he walked briskly. A plan began forming in his mind. If there was no pursuit all the way to the road to Karpovka, waiting for the night bus would be a terrible idea. Staying at the stop and waiting for Dolgov would be both uncomfortable and dangerous, so taking the path to Karpovka was the best option. They decided to walk to the road. While getting a ride could mean taking risks, staying at the house overnight would be extremely dangerous. They could be targeted for attacks, with intruders breaking windows and even trying to set everything on fire. So running even without certainty that the imminent dangers would materialize seemed the most sensible choice to ensure their own safety. Plus, their nerves couldn't handle such an anguishing night of waiting. They put on their coats and went outside. Out there, there were no signs of anyone other than the soft howl of the wind. Vitka, not wanting to waste time locking the door, simply closed it. Damn this house, he muttered to himself. If he was going to disappear, so be it. Looking around, they headed for the other end of the village, where a dirt road led to Karpovka. It was only when the path to the road became more exposed, with no bushes or trees to hide behind, that Kirill, wearing the gas mask, commented, maybe you're dreaming. How many of them were in the yard? Vitka grumbled in response. Dressed like Babka but with the gas mask on, he continued. Kirill slowed his pace. Are you serious? Your beard seems to be laughing at me, Vitka taunted. Don't treat me like an idiot, Vitka exploded. Never, at any point in my life, have I had hallucinations. If I woke up, I woke up, but here, the country air is strange, scarce. You're dreaming again, a Kirill replied with a tinge of skepticism. Don't treat me like an idiot, Vitka responded, wagging his finger in front of his friend's face. All right, all right, I give up, a Kirill conceded, agreeing to drop the subject. Just don't shout. It's getting dark already at 4.40 p.m. What time is the bus? Kirill asked, breaking the brief silence that had fallen between them. I don't remember exactly. It's getting late, we're still in Bryansk. We'll freeze waiting here. It's better we keep moving. The farther away from here, the better, and we didn't bring anything to eat, Kirill sighed, feeling the weight of the situation. He was no longer afraid, but still couldn't fully believe his friend's story about seeing someone wearing a gas mask and posing as an old woman from the village. You'll make it, Vitka said, irritated by Kirill's hesitation. The bus will return from Karpovka. We'll catch it. In the meantime, let's head towards Orki and then to the exit along the road. Maybe we can catch one of those buses there. How many kilometers left to the exit? About 14 to 15, damn, my legs are tired today. Look there, we're almost there. The road is already in sight. Karpovka appeared ahead of them, a strip of concrete and asphalt standing out against the yellowed autumn landscape. It was about half a kilometer until they reached it. No cars had passed while they were walking. They went past the villages along the road, Pervomeski and Orkovka. Some windows with stove smoke indicated life in the yards and streets, but there were no people around, only the occasional barking of dogs. An SUV passed heading towards Karpovka, followed by the sound of an engine from the other side. A Volkswagen. 
Vitka and Kirill stopped, looking back, but the driver accelerated and overtook the pedestrians going the wrong way, as if afraid to get too close to them. They watched as the car disappeared from view and decided to keep going forward. Soon behind them, they heard another engine approaching. The two stopped and waited, seeing an old beige Lada with round headlights coming towards them. An elderly man was behind the wheel, with a grizzled beard and a comfortable flat cap. He stopped the car and leaned out the window, opening the front passenger door. Why are you walking around here? he asked, surprised. Don't you know where we're going? Vitka said, taking the lead. He occupied the front seat while Kirill settled in the back. The driver frowned, turned the steering wheel and muttered to himself, his words unintelligible. Where are you headed? Kirill asked. To Kamajan, the old man grumbled. Vitka paused, trying to remember. Kamajan was near Ziriatino, in the opposite direction of the exit. However, it would be easy to get back to the city from there overnight. Ahead of them, a crossroads loomed, to the right, the exit, to the left, Ziriatino, straight ahead, the first houses of Orki. The moment they approached the bend, a van covered by a dark green tarp blocked the path of the Ladas. It seemed military in nature, with no visible identifying markings. It had long metal cylinders, resembling inverted umbrellas at one end, suggesting they could be tear gas weapons. The men inside the vehicle formed a line about 30 meters away, while the old driver braked sharply, throwing Vitka against the dashboard in surprise and fear. Ordered by the driver, Vitka and Kirill hurriedly got out of the car as the vehicle maneuvered and drove off in the opposite direction. We need to find a side road, Vitka muttered, his vision blurred by adrenaline. They hesitated briefly before plunging into the forest. The sound of weapons ceased momentarily, but was soon replaced by the murmur of the men and the distant rumble of the van's engine, indicating they were being followed. Karuka grabbed Vitka by the sleeve and pulled him through the dense vegetation, navigating obstacles until they were out of breath. I can't take it anymore. We need to stop, Ovitka grumbled. I'm thirsty, he added his throat dry. We can't afford to stop now, said Karuka, his voice tense. We must press on. They proceeded in the direction indicated by the navigator, staying alert for any sign of danger. However, they soon found themselves confronted by swamps and wetlands, making progress difficult. We won't be able to reach the road this way, Vitka admitted, resigned. Maybe we should head towards Ziriatino or spend the night and assess the situation in the morning. It's a sensible idea, Kuruko agreed. They opted for an abandoned house, but quickly realized it wouldn't be a safe refuge due to the damp and cold. We should look for another, Vitka suggested, worried about the possibility of contracting respiratory illnesses. They found a house with a locked door, indicating relative safety. We need tools, said Kuruka, his voice tense with urgency. Where will you find them? Vitka asked, concerned. Outside, where the guys came from, Karuka replied, outlining a plan. They hid in silence, listening as footsteps approached. The grass whispered underfoot, branches cracked, and the swamp bubbled, creating an ominous atmosphere. Flashlight beams appeared behind the trees. They're here, Vika exclaimed nervously. Let's hide in some house, inside a closet, Karuka suggested. They'll never find us there. Yes, it's a good idea. They were following our tracks the whole time. They won't discover us in the closet. Let's go there quickly. Karuka's smartphone was running out of battery, so Vitka threw it away. The device disappeared into the darkness of the forest as if dissolving into the air. Vitka found himself on the main street of the village of Karpovka, not sure how many kilometers they were from Arkhangelsk. He advanced cautiously, knowing he had all the time he needed. Ahead, the welcoming lights of Karpovka shone, indicating it wasn't too late yet, people were still awake. He knocked on the first house with lights on, but got no answer. The curtains were drawn, and it seemed the residents refused to answer. The same happened at the next houses, despite sounds of activity coming from inside. Finally, he reached the main square of the village, where an abandoned two-story building stood out along with an operational grocery store. Near the grocery store was a public telephone, but Vitka couldn't hear anything on the other end when he tried to make a call. 
His eyes scanned the street, resting on the village exit where he spotted a concrete bus stop and a piezy bus with its door open and lights on, offering a possible escape route. Could they have not spent too much time and managed to catch the bus? Vitka pondered with a glimmer of hope. Nothing surprising coming from Arkhangelsk. He ran towards the bus, hurrying up the steps, but to his disappointment found no passengers aboard. The driver's seat was also empty. Once again, nothing surprising. End of the line, he concluded resignedly. Knowing the journey was long, nearly two hours, and with only ten minutes between the outbound and return schedules, Vitka presumed the driver had likely stepped away for a break. He chose a more comfortable window seat and soon fell asleep. Upon waking, he felt the biting cold and rubbed his eyes, noticing the lights were still on and the bus engine was off. Time passed, but the driver didn't return. Suddenly, the passenger door closed, the engine rumbled to life, and the bus began moving. A distorted sound came over the speaker, breaking the silence. How far to Bryansk? Vitka asked into the perceived emptiness, expecting a reply from the driver. 150 kilometers, a metallic voice responded, making Vitka start as he realized there was someone there, wearing overalls and a gas mask, facing backwards down the road, driving the vehicle with impressive skill. Behind him, two shadowy figures remained, their features hidden in darkness. Did they set out from here to find us? Vitka wondered mentally, feeling a chill run down his spine. In a moment of rising panic, Vitka stood up and headed towards the driver, but found only two opaque windows. He couldn't see anything through them, but an ominous sense of presence overcame him. He dropped his bag, moved towards the exit and tried to open the door, but it remained stubbornly closed, as if purposely locked. He jumped onto the inner hood, kicking at the driver in desperation. However, the blow seemed to have no effect, as if the man was made of elastic rubber. The bus finally stopped, and the driver stood up, grabbing Vitka by the feet and throwing him to the ground, before something more. Vitka regained consciousness in the biting cold, his head throbbing and face bloodied. The vehicle's headlights burned into his eyes as he tried to get up, battling the pain. After several attempts, he managed to turn over, though his vision was still blurry and swaying. Before him, the outline of a van or coach loomed. He found himself captured like prey. Unable to see clearly, Vitka sensed the presence around him, figures lined up, all in gas masks and holding thin cylinder-like umbrellas pointed at him. A click echoed as they opened the pedals of the umbrellas. In a desperate surge, Vitka tried to run but found himself stopped by an invisible barrier. A blow revealed a perfectly transparent glass wall, preventing his advance in any direction. His subsequent attempts were equally thwarted by the invisible barrier. Memories of cartoons about force fields and robots flooded his mind as he struggled to find an exit from the invisible trap. Finally, he broke free and ran desperately between the rows of corn stalks, seeking refuge in the deepening darkness. As night fell, the clear starry sky cast an eerie light over the cornfield. Vitka paused to catch his breath, sensing the deafening silence around him. However, his peaceful moments were interrupted by the faint rustling of leaves, indicating someone's approach. Deciding not to risk staying still, Vitka pressed on. As he advanced along the field's edge, he spotted something indistinct in the distance. Drawing nearer, he discovered corn stalks twisted in an odd way he had never seen before. Pulling one of the stalks, horror struck him. Inside was Kiryuka, with a petrified expression and bulging eyes amidst the stalks. A hollow, disturbing sound escaped his throat, echoing across the field. Vitka turned and ran desperately along the field's edge, seeking an escape route. Another hollow sound echoed, louder and more frequent, as something flew over the edge. Blinded, Vitka fell to his knees, rubbing his eyes in agony, unsure what else awaited him that grim night. When the pain finally subsided, Vitka wiped away tears and stood, determined to continue although his steps were now unsteady. Another large leaf flew over the edge right in front of him, shattering the stillness. And then another. And another. Vitka turned back, surprised to see leaves also flying that way. He tried to bat them away with his hands, but they began wrapping around his wrists, pulling with increasing force. His scream echoed through the air as he struggled, but soon he was engulfed by the buzzing vegetation around him. 